welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, CWD Program Standards 2018. Please note that all person lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the call. We'll provide you with instructions on ask a verbal question at that time. You are welcome to submit written questions during the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. To submit a written question, use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Choose All Panelists from the Send To drop-down menu. If you require technical assistance, send a note to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the call over to Dr. Alicia Nuggle. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Rita. Uh, very happy that everyone can join us this afternoon to uh, participate in our webinar. For those that don't know me, my name is Alicia Noggle, and I am the director for the Sheep, Goat, Cervid, and Equine Health Center, which includes the Cervid Health Team. And we've got members of our team here today to share with you an overview of the revisions that we've made to our Chronic Wasting Disease Program Standards document. Um, a couple purposes of our webinar and conversation this afternoon. The first is we plan to highlight some of the more significant changes that were made to the program standards. And we've specifically tailored this afternoon's conversation um, to be applicable to our producers as well as our industry organization representatives. So we're very appreciative that you joined us. Um, a second purpose of our conversation today will be to help answer any questions you may have or clarify any items in the program standards that aren't clear. Um, as you know, we're accepting written comments through April 30th, so we hope that today can help maybe answer some questions that, that will allow you to provide the robust comments that we would like to receive. Just a reminder, um, we'll certainly answer questions and have discussion today. However, we do ask that you submit written comments through www.regulations.gov so that we can capture and respond to those accordingly. So as a way of introduction, um, recall that veterinary services and APHIS um, have been working on revising our program standards for CWD for some time. In the summer of 2016, we formed a working group that consisted of state and federal animal health officials, wildlife officials from different states, um, and some industry representatives. And the purpose of that group was to review the program standards and identify areas that needed to be updated and then discuss what options existed for making those updates. After we completed the working group meetings, we published a report and discussed that at the 2016 U.S. Animal Health Association meeting. We also accepted written comments and address those as we looked at revising the, the program standards. So hopefully what you've seen today and what we're going to be going through today, um, it, there were two overarching kind of general goals in addition to many of the specific items we wanted to address in the program standards. Um, first, we had heard a lot of comments that the program, that the former version of the program standards um, really needed to clarified in certain areas and streamlined. So we worked really hard to get rid of redundant language and um, streamline the document and make it more readable. Secondly, there were areas in the program standards that were not consistent with the CFR. And we made every effort in this revision to ensure consistency between what we're requiring in the standards and what's written in the CFR. So hopefully you're able to identify those changes as you, as you work through and read the program standards. And so now I'm going to turn it over to two of our team members, Dr. Tracy Nichols and Dr. Nancy Hannaway, to go over the overview of the revision to the program standards. So Tracy and Nancy, take it away. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is Tracy. Um, so today we're going to go over some content differences. So this is just a quick overview, and then we'll get into each of these. We're going to talk about consequences of poor quality and missing samples, um, animal and diagnostics, what changes are in the program standards, and how that would be utilized in this new revision. There have been some changes to sample collection and submission. 
Uh, we provided some um, epidemiological investigation clarifications because there seems to be um, ongoing confusion about some of the definitions. Uh, we're going to talk about how we evaluate and prioritize requests for federal indemnity. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about biosecurity recommendations for farm service facilities. That's something a little new. So to start off our presentation today, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hannaway, and she's going to talk about um, missing and poor quality samples. Thank you, Tracy. Um, the first section on poor quality in the samples, as you know, surveillance is the key to increasing our confidence that HTP certified herds are at low risk. And poor samples, uh, missed samples, unfortunately they undermine our ability to assess the status of a herd and affects the integrity of our program. So we have some options for uh, the states that may wish to implement in response to this issue. Some of the consequences that could include, number one, replace missed or poor quality samples with samples from an equal number of animals of the same sex and species that resided in the herd at least as long as the missed animal. Your herd status could be reduced as well. Um, a loss, a reduction or delay in certification, or it could result in direct suspension of herd status for a designated period of time. So these are some um, consequences that the states may wish to impose. Of course, diagnostic labs will need to communicate sample issues to their state CWD program manager as soon as it is an apparent. Okay, slaughter surveillance. So the CFR is pretty clear about slaughter surveillance of participants in the HCP. So in the revised revisions, the revised revisions, the revised program standards, um, we updated those to reflect what is in the CFR. And so all of that is is that mortalities, including animals taken to slaughter, must be made available for CWD tissue sampling. Okay, so if it remains with the same herd owner that's a member of our participating program, they need to be tested. Animortem diagnostics, so we've been talking about this for a long time. So in this revision, we go into specifics about when we can utilize anamortem diagnostics. So I'm going to kind of dig down into the weeds a little bit on this so we all understand how and why this can be used and when. So who is eligible to have an anamortem diagnostic assay done? At this time, it's only white-tailed deer. Well, why is that? That's because we don't have enough data on elk to do the same kind of analysis that we did for white-tailed deer. That doesn't mean that we're never going to consider elk. That means just at the current time, <clears throat> we need more data. So what type of anamortem diagnostic? So we're talking about rectal biopsy and the medial retropharyngeal lymph node biopsy. So for a while there, the lymph node biopsy was kind of a topic of interest and, and all the rage, but I haven't heard a lot about it lately. However, the folks that were doing that did participate with us in some um, scientific inquiry to determine the right size of sample and so on. So that is included in here. Currently, both of these types of biopsies would be evaluated by immunohistochemistry, so that's IHC. Some things to really keep in mind about this that are important. More than one test is required. This is not a one-and-done test. And the reason for that is that lag period between early um, intake of the disease and when we can actually detect it. So we would do a day zero. So when we first decided that the herd would be eligible to do an animal diagnostic, and then again at a later time, kind of depending on what the genotype ratio is. Because you could do it one time and you're going to miss all those animals that are early because the rectum, as I like to say, is in the back of the bus. And so it takes time to come in the front of the animal to get to the back of the animal. This is a whole herd test. This is not an individual test. So you see my little nose down there, not an individual test, not a one and done. The reason being is that if we do not do a whole herd, our chance of picking it up utilizing a rectal biopsy is very low. So when can this sort of happen? How, where is it described? <clears throat> 
So if animal diagnostics are decided to be applicable to a herd, it has to be outlined in the herd plan. So this is going to take planning between your state representative and your APHIS representative. At that time, the testing timeline will also be established in the herd plan. This is based on genetics and epi data. Okay. So why, why did we finally decide to do this? Well, we want to provide pr producers that are under quarantine with an option to restore business continuity faster. Okay, we understand that you get in situations where you just happen to sell somebody at the wrong time and then there you are. So this is how we're trying to help you get out of that situation. So how is this um, applicable under what circumstances? When can we use this? So this is on traceback herds. So these are herds that have CWD exposure um, or the epi-linked herds. And Nancy's going to talk about um, these sort of herds here in a little bit to clarify what that is. But those, those are exactly what I'm talking about, herds that have sold to a positive site and the animal is gone, so it wasn't tested for whatever reason, then they're, they're pulled into um, um, a quarantine. So how can we potentially get them up? This is not for routine surveillance. It is not appropriate for that purpose. So when can we use it? First thing we need to know is the ratio of at codon 96. We know that codon 96 strongly influences that incubation period, and GGs are our fastest group of incubators. So we need at least 50% of GGs in the herd to utilize animal and diagnostics. So we, we put numbers on paper and crunched. And what happens is if you go under that percentage, your ability to detect positives goes way down because of that lag period. The GSs and the SSs are very slow. So you could have them incubating CWD up in the front of the animal and retropharyngeal lymph nodes. It just hasn't gotten to the rectal tissue yet. So because of this strong influence, we have to know what what we have in the herd. So just a reminder, the GGs incubate faster than the GSs, and they're faster than the SSs. Okay, how is this going to be done? In the program standards, we have very detailed collection and submission um, instructions. So this is important for um, our accredited veterinarians and our state and federal veterinarians to understand what needs to go in and how it needs to be submitted. This is going to be a little different than normal regulatory samples. In, for rectal biopsy and medial retropharyngeal biopsy, the testing must be done at NVSL. It cannot go to any of our non laboratories. Um, and this would be at the owner's expense. Sample collection must be supervised by a state or federal animal health official. This is not something that is done without those folks present for both um, collection of blood for genotyping and the actual sample. So along that vein, sample collection submission, we have some, we have some new material here um, that I think is important to understand for even postmortem submission. So in the past, one lymph node needs to be submitted fixed. Uh, we wanted fresh. People weren't really doing that. Um, so there's some changes. We want the retropharyngeal lymph nodes cut longitudinally, so each one and half lengthwise. Half of the left and half of the right go into formalin, and then the other half of the left and the other half of the right are fresh. Why do we do that? The reason is, is that we have a, a proportion of animals that have unilateral distribution of CWD. And so what that means is that the positive staining is only in one lymph node. Well, that's great if you just happen, it's a 50-50 chance, to pick the correct lymph node to submit. What about the rest of the animals that only had it in one side and we picked the wrong side? So this is to address that issue so we're not missing a percentage of our pauses and, and increases our certainty about the animals. Another thing that's new is the um, requirement to submit an ear tag with a one-inch square piece of tissue attached. Why are we doing that? Well, this one's a really important one. It, before in the program standards, it was suggested that this was done if you might want DNA. Well, there's been a number of situations where we really wanted to genetically match up the submitted positive sample with the ID to confirm identification and site identification. If we don't have fresh tissue with an official ID attached, this becomes 
difficult, if not impossible, to do with any level of confidence. So this is going to address that issue. Please note that this is a fresh submission of the ear and the, the tag. When it goes into formalin, formalin but starts developing disulfide bonds with DNA. And when that happens, you can't isolate and amplify the DNA for your identification test. So super important. I think it's a good time to mention that we've also um, started a, a process and policy where if we have an index case, so a new herd that comes down positive with CWD, at the program's expense, and assuming we have this tissue and ear tag available, okay, with the official ID, that we will pay for the genetic test to make sure that it is the correct animal and it corresponds with the submitted positive test. Again, this is only for brand new index herds, okay? But again, we can't do that if we don't have the official ID with some tissue. So anamortem, how are these tissues going to be um, you know, submitted and what, and what do we need? So for rectal biopsy, we need a one centimeter by one and a half centimeter rectal biopsy. Again, that's going to go to NBSL. If you are doing the medial retropharyngeal lymph node, that's a two centimeter by one centimeter, centimeter by one centimeter. And that was developed to be comparable with postmortem. So NDSL determined that 40 follicles are required to really have a comparable sample along that line. Also, blood. This has to do with our genetics that we care about when we're looking at animal diagnostics. So we need three to five mils of whole blood in EDTA for the code, code on 96 genetics. So it's going to be chilled or frozen. It's important that it stays cold. And this, again, this is something that's going to be done with your state um, and, or federal VMOs. So sample collection submission. This is one that we really need to pay attention to. There's been a trend with some folks to sit on samples, and not just producers. There's accredited veterinarians that have done this. This is a big problem. So this was in our old program standards, but I want to emphasize this. Those samples need to be submitted within seven days. And the reason for that is if you sit on those or the veterinarian drives around with them in their truck for, you know, several weeks, any animals that have moved in that amount of time are now somebody else's problem, okay? Because now we have a trace-out situation. If it had been submitted and we'd done it as soon as possible, if there was a problem, we would not allow that movement of that deer to come into your site and now get you in trouble, okay? So this is, this is on you guys as well to be pretty adamant with your accredited veterinarian saying, you need to submit this tomorrow. So you collected it today, you need to get that in. Or if it's a Friday, you need to get that in on Monday. So part of it is on you guys to make sure that your attending veterinarians for your herds are doing what needs to be done. Okay, animal and biopsies are to be collected only by trained state, federal, or accredited veterinarians. Because this is a surgical procedure, your approved collectors, in some states that this, this is something that happens, not all states, so it varies, they are not allowed to collect these samples, okay? It has to be a veterinarian. And your accredited veterinarians must be monitored by state health or VS representatives, and this is to ensure um, sample integrity. So now I'm going to turn it over to Nancy to talk about some epidemiological investigation clarification. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the classification of animals and the different types of herds that are associated with investigation. We know what a CWD positive herd is. Um, that's where a CWD positive animal resided at the time of diagnosis. A traceback herd is one in which a CWD positive animal resided in the last five years. And then we have what's called an epi or epidemiological linked herd. Um, and this is where a herd where animals that resided with a CWD positive animal have lived within five years of diagnosis of that positive animal. Uh, some people think of this possibly maybe as a trace forward situation, uh, but until that herd has been, or the status of that animal has been determined, we just consider it epi-linked. So uh, first epi-linked situation would be if animals were sold from a positive herd 
um, and have been with that positive animal, but we don't know the status. So that those animals, like I said, they were with the positive, they were sold to another herd, and so then we look for that pos or that exposed animal. Um, and so if we get there, and if the animal is absent, whether it died or left and didn't get tested, uh, then there's a couple different things we can do. Number one would be that herd would go under quarantine uh, from five years from the last date of exposure, or if it's a white-tailed deer herd uh, and all the parameters are in place, we could do some anamortem testing to get that producer off quarantine quicker than five years. Now the other possibility would be if you got into the herd and the animal was present. If the animal's present, then that's actually a good thing. We could test the animal. If it's non-detect, quarantine's lifted. Um, if it's positive, however, then it would be a new positive herd. Traceback herds, like I said, that's anywhere that CWD positive animal resided in the last five years. So you have your positive herd, and then, like I said, we need to go back. Hopefully it's just one herd, but sometimes it's more than one herd. So that herd would be under quarantine for five years from the date of last exposure. Uh, again, possibly that would be a case where we could use anamortem testing to get that producer off quarantine sooner. And then another epi-linked herd situation might be where we have a traceback herd and there's some animals that were exposed to uh, the positive in that herd. They've now been sold to other herds. Sometimes they just go to one, sometimes they go to another one, and even more than that. So when we get to those herds, it's, it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if the animal is there and we can test that animal, like I said, um, and it's non-detect, they get released from quarantine. If the animal isn't there, then we have to look at either uh, quarantine for a last date of exposure for five years or potentially, like I said, anamortem testing. So. Um, these can be a little challenging to deal with. Um, however, that's how most of them work. Like I said, it's, um, sometimes it can be, like I said, very interesting. So you do have to do case by case on the epilink curves. And we have included a diagram just to show the flow of what can happen with some of these animals um, and the movement and how they would be classified in the program standards. Okay, um, evaluation prioritization for request for federal indemnity. A lot of people have asked how do we determine what herds uh, will be depopulated with federal indemnity, and we wanted to be very transparent about the process, um, and we have listed the different factors that we look at when we do make these decisions. Of course, the first factor is availability of funds. We would love to have enough money to um, fairly indemnify all exposed and positive herds. However, the truth and the reality is we only have a million dollars to work with for federal indemnity. So it does go pretty fast, especially when you have large herds or animals that all are appraised at the maximum level of $3,000. We look at herd size. If the herd is maybe over 600, 700 animals, we just don't have enough money to indemnify the whole herd. Herd status, um, a CWD positive herd is going to take priority over a herd that's just exposed or has suspects. The type of herd, a breeding herd would have priority over a hunt preserve. We look at HCP status, is the herd enrolled in the program? Have they been compliant? Um, are there, or are they not enrolled? And of course, in the enrolled and compliant producers will have presidents. We look at the status of the surrounding area. Is it detected in the wildlife or is it not? And of course, um, if it has not gone into the wildlife yet, again, they would have higher priority than someone who is already endemic in the area. We look at survey density in the local area. Are there a lot of deer? Not too many gear. Um, and then we also look at value of postmortem testing that can inform our epi and decision making process, not only on that herd, but potentially maybe on some of the trace out herds that are involved. Okay, Tracy. All right, so for those of you that know me, know this is one of my favorite topics. <clears throat> so, biosecurity recommendations for farm service. 
So this is not written, unlike Canada, which is required, okay, we don't have this as a requirement, it's a recommendation, but it is in your best interest to start thinking about these things and implementing them on your site to protect yourself. So biosecurity is a process, it's referred to as procedures to reduce the risk of introducing CWD and other diseases to a farm. To reduce, we wish it could prevent, that would be awesome, but even the most carefully laid plans, sometimes disease of any type can slip through. So we want to reduce that risk. So recommendations for farm service facilities. The first one is prevent direct contact between cervids and wildlife. So the first um, and probably the most important is try to prevent contact with wild cervids. The fence line is not a lot of protection, right? So what can you do to make the fence lines less appealing? Um, some suggestions may be keep your feeders away from fence lines. You don't want to attract uh, wild cervids with food up to your fence lines. Um, there have been recommendations on this about reducing forage along fence lines on both sides. Don't make it attractive. Birds, I know some of you all have some serious kind of bird issues. So trying to devise strategies to keep them out of your feeders and waterers is important. And it may be a situation where you need to consult um, with your local wildlife agencies. It's like, okay, how can I haze birds? How can I deter them from wanting to come onto my farm? And there are a number of strategies different folks have used. Um, one man that I'm aware of had used a hawk call system that didn't seem to agitate the deer, but it kept a lot of the small birds out of his feeders. Um, night feeding might also be an option. I've seen some feeders that are on timers. So there, there are some things to think about, because birds, I, I think they're kind of suspicious characters. So um, if you can keep them out of your feed and water, I think you're far better off. And this isn't just for CWD. I want to emphasize that. There are a number of other diseases that you do not want on your site as well. Um, feral hogs. Feral hogs love deer feed. So if you have washouts and you have loose fences at the bottom where these little darlings can push their way through, um, you want to keep them out. There are a number of things they can bring into your farm that you just don't want. And then, of course, there's other animals, um, and some of them are a little harder to control, like raccoons, which can climb, and possums. Um, but, but think about keeping wildlife out of, out of your facilities. Then there's indirect contact. So this is the deer having contact with potentially contaminated objects or materials on your farm. The most obvious would be feed and hay. I know some folks store their hay outside of their high fence. That is something you want to get away from doing because wild deer love hay. So they're really thanking you for that and they're going to come up and eat your hay and put their saliva and everything else all over your hay and then you're going to take it inside your fence. You don't want to do that. So keep your feed and hay away from wildlife. And humans, well, you guys are really great about helping each other out between farms, which is awesome. However, you may inadvertently be bringing disease back and forth. So if you can reduce your foot traffic with boots that have been on your farm, then you're going to go to your buddies. What I would suggest is perhaps taking and buying um, sets of muck boots for your farm. So when your friends come to help you run the deer through for TB testing or vaccinations, you put on boots that stay on your farm. So your, your friend's boots that he may have walked through his pens and have some feces stuck in the bottom and dirt, let's, let's keep those off and in his truck and you can give him these muck boots to use while he's on your property. There's just no sense in, in putting that kind of risk in place when it's so easy to prevent it. Vehicles and equipment, um, sharing of skid loaders, ATVs, that sort of thing that have mud on them. You want to avoid sharing those as well. So we talk about these things in the program standards, and, and I like to talk about them in meetings because I think it's a really good idea for you guys to start thinking about protecting your farms from CWD and other diseases.